over geological time, and here we're not talking over 100 years or even 1,000 years, we're talking about a long time, the action of water and salt and oxygen will convert part of that silver sulfide into silver chlorides or native silver. Since the local populations couldn't care less in the end about silver, these deposits were virtually in the virgin state. These were case, well, textbook examples of a weathered silver deposit. Why the first Spanish contingents? They start scraping out the easier deposits in silver chloride. I was going to say even you could refine it. I won't say that. Anyone could refine it with a minimum of skill, with a real minimum of skill. And so the first tons of silver coming out of the new world came from these weathered superficial silver deposits. The problem began when they started going deeper and deeper and deeper. Then you go from silver chlorides to silver sulfides. And that is a completely different animal. If you want to smelt the silver sulfide, you have to get a furnace, go up to 1000 degrees centigrade, you have to know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, you won't get any silver out. And that's when they started complaining. The silver content is going down. And I had a strong suspicion it wasn't the silver content that was going down. It was simply the nature of the silver compound was changing dramatically, and they didn't know what was happening. Very quick. Um, smelting. And I, I thank God Michael touched on this. No, because people don't like to work at high temperatures. And I, even I, as a student, I hated that. I, the, the dry laboratory is one that you tend to say, no way. You know, you get burnt, uh, you, things happen. Um, you're working at 1,000 degrees centigrade. Uh, forget your ovens at home. I mean, that's really high. To smell silver, it's a, it's a two step operation and they're completely different uh, chemical, uh, physical <coughs> The first one, you have to make sure that the silver ore mixes with the charcoal of the fuel that you're using. There has to be a mix, because the carbon participates. And the silver in the silver ridge, Galena, 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 whatever, uh, will be abstracted by the liquid lead and then you get this pig coming out of a silver rich lead bar with a silver content I've seen between 5 and 10 percent uh, depending how, how good your initial pour is. That is not enough. Now you have to go to another furnace which if you've seen a pizza furnace it's, it's you know com uh, convex, concave, anyway, a dome the fuel cannot mix, in this case, with the ore that you're trying to, to refine. You have to keep them separate, so the heat has to be directed to reflect from the roof onto the pig. And then you have to blow oxygen on top of the liquid uh, lead that will form litharge, which is the oxide of lead that can be absorbed by the pupil, or you can simply scrape it out. And you have to keep on doing that until at the end you are left with pure silver. Though if you have gold in the initial law, the gold will be there, um, which makes it a problem. Then you have to refine it. And then you go all the way to the pieces of paper. You go to amalgamation, and I won't go through all the steps. Um, you suddenly don't have to work at a thousand degrees centigrade. You know, you can work on a battery, on a courtyard, an open courtyard. There's no heat involved. They can be, but not necessarily. So it's no wonder that the early refiners were offered this other route that didn't involve such a complicated uh, high temperature operation. They loved it. Um, th this was, you know, an answer to their prayer because it also managed to extract silver from that horrible stuff coming from the deeper part of the mine. 
when we go tomorrow or on Friday, uh, it struck me that all the, here in the States in Nevada, uh, the refining units, they're called mills. They're not called uh, silver refining factories or whatever, it's, it's a mill, right? Uh, the so-and-so mill and the so-and-so mill. I think this is a reflection of the fact that in amalgamation, believe it or not, the crucial step was the milling. You needed to arrive at the consistency of a flower. I mean, really, really fine, or else there would be no way that the mercury would interact uh, with a compound, with a silver compound. Not only that, I am of an age where I remember breaking thermometers simply to get the mercury to run across the floor. If anyone's done that, um, you know, it splits into tiny, tiny droplets. Thank God it splits into tiny, tiny droplets. Mercury is so dense that if you throw a hammer, the hammer will float on mercury. Uh, iron will float on mercury. So if mercury, when you dropped it into the amalgamation slurry, had remained a single big mass, it would have gone straight to the bottom, and that's it. There would have been no reaction. It's a fact that mercury can split into these tiny, tiny spheres that made all this process possible. The other message I want to give is that the recipe for amalgamating silver sulfide, silver sulfide was um, finalized, polished, and made permanent around the year 1580 <coughs> in the high Andes by a bunch of refiners who simply went on their intuition. They had no theory to guide them. And they took a very simple, very primitive gold amalgamation recipe and suddenly made it work on silver sulfur. Because if you only take the primitive gold amalgamation recipe, it won't extract anything out of a silver sulfur. So this was the critical and crucial step. You will go into shock with this one, but I'll be quick. There is no worse mistake being made in the historiography up to now than to think that the amalgamation of ore has anything to do with the amalgamation of silver ore. We are talking of something of two completely different things. The only thing they have in common is the word amalgamation. In a silver ore, you're looking at a sequence of chemical reactions taking place. And in this, the Germans were totally right at the end of the 18th century, the metallurgists in Germany who were saying, I don't know what these Spaniards are talking about. Amalgamating silver ores. Mercury doesn't amalgamate a silver compound. And they're totally right. Mercury only amalgamates silver metal, pure silver. So during the process, you have to make sure that all the silver compounds that are in the ore are converted into silver. And that is when mercury will come along and grab it. If you cannot guarantee that the silver compound will stay in the ore, mercury will go on its way. Luckily, again, mercury does the two jobs up to a point at the same time. It intervenes as a reagent so that when you have silver chloride together with mercury you will form calomel and you will get metallic silver. And then another uh, blob of mercury around will take the silver and amalgamate it. But you've got two different steps. If you add iron, iron will bring down the mercury consumption because iron will also convert the silver chloride into silver metal, which then amalgamates. And the beauty of the final recipe of that 16th century is that if you have copper uh, in the form of a salt, the copper will take directly the silver sulfide, go all the way to silver, and then mercury takes it on. But if I were to show you a similar diagram for the case of amalgamating gold, there'd be nothing there. It would be the shape of the ore, 
gold stuck in the middle, Mercury will come along, take it away. Nothing like this happened before. So any comparison that you read about, or any reference that tries to tie what's happening with silver amalgamation of gold has nothing to do with it. Okay, uh, now I'm getting to the second part. This I derived from tax data, so um, there is a chance I may not have it completely right, but at least I've shown uh, in my work how I did it, so someone can come along and polish it if necessary. From an empirical point of view, the message is clear. In New Spain, a refiner could refine using amalgamation, he could refine using smelting, he would still make a profit, because these are private individuals, if they're not making a profit, they're not going to produce one single gram of silver. What amazed me, because there's no similar curve out there in the historiography, uh, what amazed me was between 1640, and this is why yesterday I was in Claudia, 1640 is a, is a milestone, roughly, up to about the middle of the 18th century, you get these two processes more or less sharing the production of silver. This is from New Spain. Um, I remember, I hope you remember I told you, the ores in New Spain had lead, had gold, and had silver. If you have gold, it helps with the economies of smelting, because then you can sell the gold and recover part of your production costs. And if you have lead, that, that's a problem. Um, in fact, if you only have silver-rich lead, the only thing you can do is smelt. You cannot amalgamate. Lead amalgamates with mercury. And there will always be much more lead in an ore than silver. So if you add mercury to a lead ore, the lead will take over the mercury and leave nothing left for it to work with silver. This is what I repeat. Here, um, if you were a miner and you came upon a lead, a silver rich a lead deposit, you either smelt it efficiently or you packed up and went away. And that was it. Uh, there was no middle ground. If you came across a silver sulfide, which would be uh, most probable, and you would tend to go to mercury first because it's much easier uh, for, for the workforce of the process to go ahead if you have a mercury. During those years when mercury wasn't available or the supply became quite constrained from Spain, it may be that some uh, switched to smelting if they had access to lead and to fuel, to charcoal. Charcoal, for every kilogram of silver smelted, you need one ton of charcoal. It's a thousand to one ratio. It's a horrible ratio. It's one of the highest I have seen. Iron ores, copper ores are way below. For silver, it's around 1,000 to And it's been that way since the Middle Ages, and it only changed in the 19th century. So if you didn't have fuel, that was a big problem. The question now is, OK, but why should any of these two processes have been profitable to start with? Um, there's no a priori reason why they should work in the new world having been uh, profitable at least melting in the old world. For colonial times, there is a horrible absence of hard data on production costs. Um, one of the things that struck me when I was doing research is how many, how many people have worked this and no one has published long time series of data for either amalgamation or smelting in the colonial period. So I had nowhere to turn to because we go through the archives, uh, at least superficially, the documents are not there. You can find nuggets of information, indirect clues, but there's no timeline of events that you can follow and, and put that data into a, a, a production cost basis. So I went to the 19th century, where I found that the Hacienda de Regla on the outskirts of Pachuca, a gold mine of data. I mean, 
it, uh, this was 10 to 15 years of accounting data by <coughs> me, um, telling me how much they were bringing to inventory, how much they were using, what it cost them, how much they were losing. Incredible. Um, and so from there, this represents roughly 100 or more monthly collections of data. So this is not a one-off average. Uh, this is the average over 10 to 15 years. And the first surprise is, hey, mercury is not what determines the cost of production in a market nation, which is something you may read about. It's a cost of the oil. There's an old Mexican saying, um, Claudia will correct me, uh, the broth turns out to be more expensive than the meatballs it contains. That's, that's the translation. Uh, <coughs> what this is saying is when you've got ores with about 0.2% silver, 0.3% silver, you have to process roughly 1,000 kilograms of useless mineral ore to get at the one kilogram of silver. And that is virtually a fixed variable operation cost. And there will come a time when whatever you get out of silver may not be enough to cover that operation cost. So fuel, and that's the other message from this, fuel is not irrelevant, but virtually irrelevant in, in an organization, the way it was practiced in Layla. And uh, David Sinclair got, got the message very well. All this data is site, location, and time specific. There are no generalizations in this. That would be the most dangerous thing to do. So this applies to Rega. OK, to go into colonial times, what I did was, these are real figures okay, from the accounting books, the following Rega. And then I simply project. Um, some of these costs will not vary according to the silver content, some will. Because again, one of the most dangerous things to do is to compare amalgamation and smelting without specifying what's the silver content of the ore that I want to compare according to these two processes. You cannot do a blanket comparison saying amalgamation is better or smelting. No, it depends on the silver content of the ore. So you need a function. You need a function of cost versus silver content. And that is why I, what I ended up with. This is the value from the accounts, and all these are projected values. Um, well, you can see how uh, the whole profile changes. I did the same with smelting. Here I will only point to the fact that in smelting, it is not the cost of the ore that dominates, it is the cost of fuel. Charcoal made up nearly a third of uh, production cost. I did the same, I will not spend too much on that. And I'm nearly finished, this is one, one more. Um, then I did what you shouldn't do. And uh, I don't want to confuse you. For some ores, uh, silver rich lead ores, you cannot superimpose the two curves on a single graph because you cannot amalgamate, okay? you can only smelt. So either that makes sense on its own, or you shut up your operation. The only cases where you could compare is if you have silver sulfides. Because then you may have a choice, okay, do I go this way or do I go that way? Um, so please keep that in mind. What I found is that for regular in the 19th century, amalgamation, gave the lowest production cost virtually over the whole range of silver contents, even better the smel than smelting, even at high silver content. Um, and that's regular. Regular is a very special case. When I introduce historical ranges in my tables, and these are all projected values, then things to start changing a lot. In the late 16th century, Mining costs were low, 
not like in regular, because it was still a surface operation. Fuel costs were low because the woods had still not been decimated. So they had charcoal relatively close by and at an acceptable cost, etc., etc., etc. For each period, circumstances change. And you can see that the relative position of each refining process changes. So I think the basic message here, again, is define your period, define the conditions, do not apply any general rules, and it could have been one, it could have been the other, depending on condition. So, I get to the end. Why were these individuals able to make a profit that ultimately has decided even your lives, because you will be here, if they had not been successful, there would have been no silver industry, there would be no silver export, and they would all be doing something else with their lives. So that basically, we all depend in a certain way on one single Spaniard working as a minor refiner <coughs> and making a profit. It doesn't matter how big or how small because it's so difficult to judge what makes a man happy or a woman. You know, you may need a hundred pesos profit, the other one could live with a one peso. And all of these were making silver. This is a simplification because the picture changed in the, in the 16th, 17th century, the crown did not allow you to refine ores unless you were the miner. Okay, it was the only way they, they allowed you to actually refine. Moving on to the 18th century, we start getting the maquila, the tolling. The big refining units decide, hey, you know, I've got all this infrastructure set out, I'm, the, I'm one of the big players, let the little players come to me. I will take their ore, I will refine it, and I will give, you know, they pay me, and I give them uh, <coughs> The complaints of the, miners, of the minor refiners are terrible. Uh, apparently, they were not allowed to say how much silver they thought was in the ore. It depended on the owner of the hacienda. They were totally in the hands of these big refining units. So, I repeat, this is a simplification. But what we have is that for conditions such as regla, and regla, uh, let me uh, restate again, was using ores with around 0.2% silver, which is more or less the average, by the way, for silver sulfide ores in New Spain, roughly. And a little bit less than 2% for the uh, silver rich lead. They had free energy. Free energy is worth its weight in gold. Haciendas that had to use mules. They had to buy grain to feed the mules. And if the grain prices went up, and you see it in the literature, in the, in the primary literature, they simply had to close down that time because they couldn't pay uh, for the grain. So having free water to drive the mills, to drive everything, that, that in the case of regular was, was worth a huge amount. This period, uh, where my data comes from, is when finally the mercury prices from New Almaden have dropped to the ground, so they're getting very cheap mercury. The English investors of the first half of the 19th century at Vega, they were hit with all the uh, maneuvers uh, around the mercury from Almaden. And part of their losses came from having to pay three to four times what these people had to pay for mercury. Fast turnaround in Padro. I am amazed looking at the accounting books. You will read that Padro operations took between four weeks to three months. That is absurd. You cannot tie up a reactor for three months. You will never be able to make money from that. Um, imagine, you, you have one reactor, you fill it, and then you go away for three months. How do you make money? The people at Regla, and this is an anonymous manager, worker, whoever, suddenly realized that they could have a turnaround time of 15 days, and they worked on that basis. And that was, that was incredible. It, it increased their output by 60%. No environmental costs. Um, all the dirt.
coming out of rain, all the lead coming out of the chimneys. They were not accountable for that. Um, had they been accountable, then all these profit margins would have been something completely different. Cost of labor in war. I was discussing this yesterday. Remember under the Spanish, uh, that, that went on into the Republic of Mexico, a mine worker was paid, but he was also allowed to take home uh, how much, uh, as much silver ore that he could find within a certain time frame. How do you quantify that regarding labor costs? And then they resold that to the mine owner or to the refiner. So labor costs, in the case of New Spain, it, it's not an easy uh, thing to quantify. And finally, zero cost of technology. This is why yesterday I was asking about the Sinai process because I believe that when it was implemented, there were royalties paid by people in Mexico. In this case, the process was theirs, the equipment was theirs. We will see some of that equipment uh, when we go to Nevada, the Arrastras. That's Mexican, that's a Mexican invention. Uh, the Chilean mill, I don't know why they call it Chilean, but that was one way of milling uh, that came from Mexico. And lots of things that came to the US free of charge, tax and cost, nothing. For them also the zero technology cost. Though it looks good, I mean this as a gross operating margin doesn't look bad, but it looks even better. Um, when silver pricing started to go downhill in the 19th century, two things could have happened. Local cost, which is basically the black solid line, could have jumped up due to inflation. It didn't. Uh, local cost from the data I have of Rayla were like Teflon, you know, they were not being affected at all by, by this dip in silver pricing. However, if instead of one kilogram being bought at 38 pesos, will now be bought at what um, you know, if it has the value, then the slope of this curve will come down. And then you will get very close. This doesn't include you know, whatever taxes, all the costs. But rather than impact the more horizontal line, it would have impacted the slope of the content in silver that you're extracting from the oil. And maybe because I don't have the economics in my hand, maybe this was another reason why cyanide was introduced. Because maybe cyanide would have still given them a good margin of profit, even if the price of silver was coming down to have its value in the international market. That's it. I'm finished. directly from <coughs> alchemy uh, and uh, the terms and law of amalgamation is alchemical alchemy I mean the, the, to its core. Magistral, if you read alchemical books, magistral was simply a magic powder that you added to induce the transmutation of a base metal into gold or silver. That's a magistral. The magisterio was the art of alchemy in Spanish. So we had the magisterio and the magistral. I, I should have mentioned it. When I mentioned copper sulfate, that's magistral. If you look at copper sulfate, I used to do this in the lab when I was young, and I promise I wasn't smoking. <coughs> it's, it's a brilliant blue. It's a beautiful blue. It's a magical blue. You, you can stay looking at a magistral crystal for hours and hours. And I, I still have a suspicion that initially it was used they didn't know it was copper, they didn't know it was copper sulfate. 
simply because of the color and because of this alchemical, magical aspect. I said, okay, let's add this to the recipe, see what happens. Having said that, uh, reading the big bonanza by uh, the Queen, he says that up in Nevada, they were adding sagebrush tea to the amalgamation recipe. And this just to show the degree of, you know, you don't know what's going on. So you end up adding whatever you think may help. And in the end is what they did at the end of the 16th century truly is amazing. They hit it spot on and the recipe didn't change until the year 1900. That's nearly 300 years from a group of refiners with absolute no 